So, welcome folks to Valley View Baptist Church on this worship Sunday morning. Thank you for our guests on, from YouTube to be with us uh, today. We're grateful. We're grateful for our, our congregation here uh, today. So we welcome each and every one of you uh, <clears throat> to our service today. And as always, we're, <clears throat> we're speaking about our exceeding abundantly able God, a text from Ephesians 3, uh, 20 and 21. Also, we must remember that faith defeats fear. Faith defeats stress. Faith defeats anxiety. Faith defeats discouragement. And you know what? Faith defeats the devil. Amen. Amen. So, yes, God is still in the miracle business. Yes, God is still on his throne. And yes, God is still all-knowing, all-powerful, everywhere present at the same time. So with that in mind and that thought, let's just look to the Lord. Heavenly Father, as we come together to worship, to learn, to fellowship, <clears throat> to pray, to study, we're privileged to do so, and we ask your blessing on our service this morning. We just pray, Father, for those that are watching and listening, that uh, they'd be blessed and be encouraged and be uplifted. We know, Lord, these are difficult times, stressful times, but there are times, Lord, that we can exercise our faith and have victory in Jesus. And so we ask your blessing now. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Well, I do have a couple of short things that I want to uh, share with you. And it's <clears throat> Jesus' person, Jesus' words, and Jesus' works always have had and still have a twofold effect on the people. Jesus is at once a precious stone and a rock of offense. His word is a savor of life unto life and a savor of death unto death. His works lead some to believe in him, others to oppose him. We have a plain example of this before us when Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead. This is a supreme sign that causes some to believe in Jesus, but others to oppose him the more. That was written with an unknown uh, signature. So I'll share this uh, uh, with you as well. The Book of Books, Psalm 119, 18. Open thou mine eyes that I may behold wondrous things out of thy law. This book contains the mind of God, the state of man, the way of life, the doom of sinners, the happiness of believers. Read it to be wise. Believe it to be safe. Practice it to be holy. So that's our word from someone. I didn't have a, an author of that statement uh, either. So I'll just talk about the author of the Bible <laughs> here for uh, a little while. As the verse that they've read as Daniel 9, 21 and 22, and I'll get over to that, but I think for the next couple of weeks, I'm gonna use this, this verse uh, as I share with you. And this is, 70 weeks are determined upon thy people and upon thy holy city to finish the transgression and to make an end of sins and to make reconciliation for iniquity, and to bring in everlasting righteousness, and to seal upon the vision and prophecy, and to anoint the most holy. Daniel 9, 24. Think about that now as we, we uh, talk about Daniel and his, his uh, prayer life, and particularly this, this point in time. 
this ninth chapter of the prophecy of Daniel has frequently been referred to as the very backbone and skeleton of all Bible prophecy, by which we mean that it contains the framework, the general outline around which all other prophecy is built. If we err in our understanding of these 70 weeks, we shall err in all the rest of the prophetic truth. If we have the proper interpretation of the 70th week of Daniel, we have no difficulty in fitting all the rest of prophetic revelation into the general scheme and pattern which God has laid down throughout the scriptures. So this is my 29th message on, on the end times. And, uh, <clears throat> but as I said, we're going to talk about Daniel's prayer and the power of prayer that, that generated God revealing to Daniel the prophecy of the 70, 70 weeks. And, and <clears throat> I just encourage you during the week to read that, uh, that ninth chapter. So I'm going to talk about the prayer part of it and then next week about the 70 weeks of it. But I won't be talking 70 weeks more. more. Okay, so uh, our hope like Daniel's hope lies, we must confess our sins, admit, commit, admit our own worthiness, and cast ourselves completely and wholly and unreservedly upon the mercy and the long suffering of God. That's pretty much what the songs we sang this morning were all about. And we didn't collude in that. That's how the Spirit, the Spirit guides us. Well, it's refreshing then to note that Daniel pleads on the basis of the promises of Almighty God. This is a point that we cannot overemphasize. As we have <coughs> reminded you before, Daniel had been studying the scriptures and he found in them the promise <coughs> that after Israel had been sent away captive into the land of Babylon, at the end of 70 years, their captivity would end and they would be returned again to the land of Palestine. All of this was recorded, not only in the book of Leviticus, but was very definitely stated in the term 70 years, used repeatedly by Jeremiah the prophet. When Daniel find these when Daniel found these promises of Almighty God in the Word of God, he immediately began to claim them. I want you to think about that. As you read the Bible, do you claim the promises? Or do you just say, oh well, that's, that doesn't apply to me, or God never answered me that way. Let me ask you this, share this with you. Try them. You like him. Yeah. Remember uh, the breakfast commercial? You know, Mikey, try it. You'll like it. You know, I just, you know, try Jesus. You'll like him. And you'll love him. And he'll love you right back. Amen. You know, and so I just wanted to pause there uh, for that, for that uh, uh, comment. We need to learn that lesson today. We must base our pleas on the promises of God, not on our righteousness, not on our goodness, not on our merits, not on our religion, not on our good works, but only on the promises of God. This is evident from the very on outset of the prayer of Daniel in the opening sentence. We read Daniel 9.4. And I prayed unto the Lord my God and made my confession and said, O Lord, the great and dreadful God, keeping the covenant and mercy to them that love him and to them that keep his commandments. That was Daniel's plea, the basis on which Daniel made his petition to the Lord, not in self-righteousness, not in bitterness, but in humble confession of his unworthiness 
he pleaded for the mercy and the promises of Almighty God. We have the same thing in the closing of his prayer. He said, for we do not present our, our supplications before thee for our righteousnesses, but for thy great mercies. You know, folks, Daniel knew how to pray. He knew how to get answers to prayer because he went humbly before God, presented the facts as he knew them, presented the needs that he felt he and the people needed, and God answered those, those prayers. So we can go on down. In the 18th verse it's of chapter 9, For we do not present our supplications before thee for our righteousness, but for thy great mercies. Is that how we pray? We could certainly consider that. And so we have the interesting and valuable lesson that Daniel, through his, though he recognized his unworthiness, found comfort in the fact that God keeps covenant and keeps his word. So when we pray, expect answers. You don't demand answers. We're talking about faith. We're talking about faith in our prayers. Daniel exercised faith in his prayer, prayer life. So maybe some of us uh, have heard the words as are discouraged because of your sin and failure and probably because of your misunderstanding of the love of God. Imagine that there's no hope for you. Then remember that God's mercy is everlasting. You know, folks, and we pray and we feel that we don't have any hope. Hey, close your Bible. Open it up again. Close your eyes. Open them up again. Read a scripture and start to pray. You'll see how it works. It'll work. It'll work for you. So, we can boldly come before the word of God. Okay. Daniel went boldly, but he wasn't prideful. He didn't carry a, a sword. He didn't carry a, any type of uh, circumstance with him that was going to interfere with his time with God. And that's how we need to approach God. God, first of all, you're listening. Second, you have the answer. Thirdly, we want your will to be done. And I could go on and on and on, but I'm kind of getting down to the basics of what it really takes to get answers and results from our Lord. And no matter what, he loves you. He loves you. He loves you. So... Uh, not in vain has the Lord told us in 1 John 1 time, time if we confess our sins he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness I believe that this is a verse which ought to be repeated over and over and over again in the ears of God's people everywhere there are no conditions laid down at all, no strings tied to this promise, except that we confess our sins. Now, some of us may think, oh, God will never forgive us of that sin. Try him. Do what I suggested a little earlier. Try him. You'll be surprised. Okay? I've talked to you before about how we're sealed to the Lord. Sealed to him. Unbreakable relationship with God through Jesus Christ. Okay, so we just, I'm just trying to, I guess, get back to basics as it relates to our 
to our prayer life. And Daniel was just seemed to me to be an opportunity to take a week uh, out of our study on the end times and talk about Daniel just before the, an amazing prophecy of his his prayer uh, prayer life. <clears throat> well, it's it's difficult sometimes to even to say I'm sorry. It's difficult sometimes to say, Father, I have sinned. But before I get in the pulpit every Sunday, I say this, Father, forgive me and use me. Amen. And I think he's done both. Okay? So just, I just want to get this. Uh, so sometimes uh, it may be humiliating to, for the natural man. You know, man likes to exalt his own goodness. He likes to boast of his own good works. He likes to strut about uh, telling about his own achievements. But the closer we walk with God, the nearer we come to understanding the heart of Almighty God, the more we feel our complete and utter unworthiness in his sight. We'll see in our subsequent studies how this saying was further illustrated in his life, that when he met the revelation of the holiness of God, he became as a dead man. John 2, when he saw the Lord Jesus Christ, fell down as one dead in Revelation 1, 17. Isaiah, when he stood before the flaming holiness of Almighty God, called out, Woe is me, because I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. It's a good rule to be remembered at all times that the more we understand holiness, the more we abhor and admit our sin. Don't be afraid to talk to God. Don't be ashamed of what you've done. Just talk to him. Ask forgiveness. Ask to be used. And he'll do it. That's what he's waiting for us to individually and as a church to, to do. We need, we need to have a burden for the ministry, for the work of God. We need to have a burden for the souls of, of man and women, boys and girls. We need to have a heartfelt desire to keep the family as a unit. We need to keep all these things in our mind and talk to God uh, about them. And you'll be amazed in conversation after a week or two of, of this, you'll be able to say, well, I talked to God about this. I got to share his answer, you know. Try him, you like him. Okay, so that's uh, 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 the more we understand true holiness, the more we'll recognize our own sinfulness and unworthiness, and the more eager we'll be to cast ourselves upon the mercy of God and please plead for his holiness and not for our own. Well, in response then, <coughs> to Daniel's humble confession of sin and his petition to the Almighty. God sent the angel Gabriel in a swift answer to the prophet Daniel. We have the answer <coughs> in Daniel 9.20. Excuse me just a minute. Daniel 9.20. And while I was speaking and praying and confessing my sin and the sin of my people. I want to stop here just for a moment and show you that Daniel was not confessing only the sin of his people and losing himself in the crowd. He says here, I was speaking and praying and confessing my sin and the sin of my people Israel. It's very easy for us to admit 
that we are sinners, that all have sinned, that we are a sinful people, that we are a fallen race, that we are a sinning nation. But when it comes to a personal confession, that's not always so easy. Daniel, who stood head and shoulder above all of us, I'm sure was far as the record of his life is concerned, couldn't say that he was confessing his own sin. And we need to put the personal promise into our own confession, not into boasting to say I've sinned. I believe that these three words are the hardest three words in any language for anyone to say. I have sinned. I was wrong. I have done wrong. I was in the wrong. These, I repeat, are difficult words for any individual to say. But I'm kind of convinced that 95% and probably more, probably 100% of all the spiritual troubles of God's people could be alleviated if men would only learn to say, I have sinned before Almighty God. And I'm also convinced that practically all the ills of humanity would vex people and would sep separate men and women, nations and communities and churches, husbands and wives, fathers and sons, mothers and daughters, brothers and sisters could be corrected immediately if they're only willing to say, I am the blame. I am to blame. Think about it. Well, let me just kind of leave this uh, with a very practical illustration. Probably some of us having difficulty now. Probably there's a great rift between you and a loved one. Probably your home is threatened with disruption. Probably calamity is threatening in your domestic life or in your business life. Let me give you this remedy as a spiritual physician. I, I, I don't mean that boastfully. I I'm just, I'm just want to learn to say, it's my fault. Learn to say, I was wrong. Learn to say, I was to blame. You'll see that many of the difficulties which now cause heartache and distress would be immediately removed and peace and joy and tranquility would be restored. God help us to say these, these words. Well, many examples uh, we might cite. We take the case of King David. His record that in his moral record does not make very good reading. He was a man who stretched forth his hand to take another man's wife, and then to cover up his sin, committed murder. Now certainly, we would hardly expect such a man as David to be called a man after God's own heart. And yet, that's exactly, that's exactly what he is called in the scriptures. It was not because he had done these things. God never condones evil. God punishes evil, and God punished David in a very definite way. But David was called the man after God's own heart because he had learned to say, I have sinned. Let me just take another example from the New Testament. You remember the story of the prodigal who left his father's house and, and spent everything that he had in riotous living. He was restored and received again in the fellowship and the wealth of his father's home. Only when he had learned to say just three words, this is what he said to his father, I have sinned. That's all it took, wasn't it, folks? That's, that's all it, it took. He was restored. And I trust we've not occupied too much time in emphasizing uh, this truth. So. When we meet God's condition, even as Daniel did, the answer of God is not only sure, 
but it also very, very swift. So we, we read again. Yet, while I was speaking in prayer, even the man Gabriel, whom I had seen in the vision at the beginning, being caused to fly swiftly, touched me about the time of the evening oblation. And he informed me and talked with me and said, O Daniel, I am now come forth to give thee skill and understanding. Daniel 9, 21 and 22. Talk about a swift answer, huh? Daniel prayed. God said, Gabriel, get on the next flight. <laughs> get on the next flight to Babylon and take this message to, to my, my friend, Daniel. Zip, because you notice that, uh, that it says that uh, it, it, it being caused to fly swiftly touched me about the time of the evening oblation. Well, I submit to you, it was rather instant. As folks were praying in heaven and, and God says, here's, here's, here's Daniel's prayer, Gabriel. Here's my answer. Go, go do it. Well, there's a lot of yeses there. Yes, God answered prayer. Yes, God sent Daniel. Yet, yes, Daniel, uh, yes, Gabriel uh, went. And, and yes, God answered da Daniel's prayer. Pretty exciting, isn't it? When you like, I'd like to have the experience of, of that type. But you know, it's available to us if we practice some of the things that, that we uh, talked about. So while Daniel was speaking, the angel Gabriel was there. Now we know from the preceding chapters that it takes time for angels to travel. They're not omnipresent as Almighty God is. They're still creatures. And so Gabriel had been sent long before Daniel had finished his petition. Daniel never finished his prayer at all. He had to interrupt it and to stop it. There's no amen at the end of Daniel's prayer because before he was through, God was already there with the answer. <laughs> and that's something. So he didn't need a amen. He would probably say, oh my golly, <laughs> isn't, this, isn't this awesome? So... Uh, there's another little touch in verse 21 that I'd like to kind of mention uh, to you. And that's that the angel Gabriel touched Daniel at about the time of the evening oblation. That was the time of the regular daily sacrifice. Of course, there was no sacrifice being offered in Babylon uh, where he was. The sacrifices of Jerusalem had been discontinued, but Daniel, even though there was no actual sacrificing going on, still observed the time that God had instituted, the time of day when the sacrifice was to be offered. During that time, he was on his face before Almighty God, still continuing his regular habit of prayer and still spiritually sacrificing unto the Lord God. And it was at this time that the angel Gabriel came. Now notice the message that the angel brings. At the beginning of thy supplication, the commandment came forth that I am come to show thee, for thou art greatly beloved. Therefore understand the matter and consider the vision. Daniel 9:23. And then follows the vision of the 70 weeks of Daniel, which is the beginning of this chapter, as I talked about a message previously. That's really the backbone and the skeleton of prophecy. And we'll get into that uh, next, uh, next, next week. So I would, I would just summarize this statement to you as we as we close
And that is willing to say, I have sinned. Willing to say, I'm sorry. Willing to say, I ask forgiveness. It's not too difficult, is it? It shouldn't, it shouldn't be. So, <clears throat> I want to close with a poem that, uh, that I memorized and then <clears throat> I missed a line or two of it, but I want to share it with you and to my friends that are on YouTube. Thanks for being with us and I just pray that, that this, this poem would, would uh, touch your heart. It's entitled, I Met the Master. I'd walk life's way with an easy tread. It followed where pleasure and or where comforts and pleasures led. Until one day in a quiet place, I met the master face to face. With station and rank and wealth for my goal, much thought for my body, but none for my soul. I'd enter to win in life's mad race when I met the master face to face. Oh, I had built my castles and reared them high till their towers pierced the blue of the sky. Had vowed, I had vowed to rule with an iron mace when I met the master face to face. I met him and knew him and blushed to see that his eyes full of sorrow were fixed on me. And I faltered and fell at his feet that day while my castles melted and vanished away. Melted and vanished and in their place not else did I see but the master's face. And I cried aloud, O oh, make me meet to follow the steps of thy wounded feet. My thought is now for the souls of men. I've lost my life to find it again. Ere since one day in a quiet place, I met the master face to face. I met the master face to face in a tent on the island of Okinawa years ago. And yes, my thought is now for the souls of men. I've lost my life to find it again. Here since one day in a quiet place, I met the master face to face. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, as We've shared today the necessity and the blessing of prayer. We've also stressed, Lord, the need for a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. The poem, I Met the Master, is a personal relationship between an individual and a master. So you folks that are out there at YouTube, if you haven't met him, introduce yourself to him today. If you haven't asked forgiveness, it's a good time to say I've sinned. We need Jesus. We need Jesus in a personal relationship. We need him. Because he'll always be there for us. We'll be sealed to him for all eternity. Oh, my friends, if you don't know him. Please open your heart to him and just say those few words. I have sinned. You died for my sin. Forgive me of my sin. Come into my heart and be my savior. As I said earlier, he will. And so I extend that invitation to you. Now, in Jesus' name, amen. amen. And so my folks there in... YouTube, God bless you. Look to the Lord. Trust him. Faith defeats a lot of enemies out there. So I just extend that invitation to you and say thank you for being with us. God bless you. If you need to contact us, it's just Valley View Baptist Church, Post Office Box 12653, Ogden, Utah, 84412. Love to hear from you. In the meantime, 
I'll be praying for you. Would you be praying for me? Thanks. God bless. Have a great, have a great day.